Good morning once again. I'm Ranjana Khanna, Assistant Secretary General for the Federation of Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Uh, in the first session, Bob did mention that this was one of the first programs being done between Woodrow Wilson Center and FICI. And I would just like to mention one more fact, that while the Woodrow Wilson Center was started in the memory of Woodrow Wilson, looking at his policy, FICI was started by Mahatma Gandhi. So we have a great legacy to work together on, both in polity and ec economy. Uh, we talked about globalization. And we're talk, going to be talking about challenges and opportunities of globalization in India at the moment. Um, before that, I thought I would do a very quick recap in terms of globalization as to where we stand today and what is the forecast. The global economy is supposed to grow from, to $72 trillion from the present $35 trillion by 2030. The, Share of trade in goods and services is going to grow up three times. Uh, in the global economy, from the 25 percent, it's going to grow to 33 percent, which means we're really talking about globalization in terms of both markets and resources, which poses a tremendous challenge. Developing countries, which have been really on the back burner in terms of participants in the global economic process, are going to be taking a much broader role and are going to be the key drivers. And a big challenge today and an opportunity that the global economy is going to be facing is going to be the middle class globally is going to double from 550 million to 1.1 billion. Now in that scenario, we couldn't have had somebody better with us than Under Secretary <coughs> Ambassador Frank Lowen who is the Undersecretary for International Trade at the Department of Commerce since November 2005. He has led not just the government policy, but also business leaders all across the world for global inter integration and globalization. In fact, he led the biggest ever business delegation to India with 259 people in November uh, 2006, which we have the privilege to host and I look forward to it being one of the first in the series that you're going to be working together on, Ambassador Lawin. Uh, his team has developed U.S. trade policies in offering market access and trade advocacy efforts. But his personal contribution, which I would rate in his ambassadorship as ambas U.S. ambassador to Singapore, has been the free trade agreement between Singapore and U.S. And that is one of the f few steps that he has taken in the process of globalization. Uh, Ambassador Lawin has been a banker in the private sector, has held senior positions in the government, in the White House, in the Department of Commerce, and is an MBA in finance from the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. So without much ado, I would like to invite Ambassador Lawin to take on the floor and talk about globalization and the challenges and opportunities there. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ranjana. I'm, I'm a bit intimidated by the electronics, but it seems to be settled now. But thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, I'm delighted. Uh, have you up here with me, and uh, it's terrific that Fiki's able to help sponsor this event, and I'm uh, particularly grateful for the terrific support that Fiki offered uh, in support of the mission we led, which was based around a conference we were co-hosting in Mumbai. Uh, so it's a very good partnership and a good friendship as well. And let me extend broader thanks to the Wilson Center <coughs> for uh, organizing this, and thanks to the audience uh, as well. Uh, today's theme is globalization in India, and what I want to do is try to bring that home and uh, present a thesis. Um, my my uh, theme is this, that I think the most critical element of India's globalization is its economic relationship with the United States. 
which <coughs> might be a somewhat provocative point. Uh, but I can say this, I believe, uh, in good faith, because historically that bilateral relationship had been a bit underweight, politically and economically. And it's only in recent years that each side, I think, is giving due emphasis to the importance of the relationship. So as India continues to go through this process of globalization and open to the world, I think we see the pattern unfold most clearly with regard to the bilateral relationship. And I want to take everybody back about a year, <coughs> uh, because it was just a year ago, March, when President Bush went to Delhi and met with Prime Minister Singh. And uh, both leaders, I think, had a very uh, palpable uh, meeting of the minds at that event. It was clear that both nations sought to move the relationship ahead, <coughs> excuse me, on both economic and the political front. And from our perspective, of course, at the Commerce Department, we really deal with the economic issues. And we got a very clear mandate out of that set of meetings uh, from the leaders. One is to promote the business and commercial ties and two is to improve the policy environment uh, so that greater economic activity can take place between our two countries. On that first point, on promoting uh, business ties, I mean, there is an extraordinary amount of activity underway. <coughs> when Jana gave us some of the figures, I can give you a few more. We saw the official figures out from India, 9.2% GDP growth last year. I think that's among the highest growth rate, if not the highest growth rate, since India's independence. But I'll give you another figure to put that in context. Just the growth alone in India's economy last year, just the delta, the increment last year in the economic growth, is equivalent to the entire Indian economy of 35 years ago. So India is growing by India every year, in India of a generation ago. You can put the same thing in a trade context as well. I pick a bilateral metric, though. India's trade with the United States last year was more than India's trade with the entire world only 19 years previous, in 1987. So India's replicated on a bilateral basis what it had achieved globally, not even a generation before. So we see these positive domestic macroeconomic trends reflected in and bolstered by the global trading numbers and by the U.S. trade numbers. So I think it's fair to say on that first point <coughs> from Prime Minister Singh and President Bush, the pace of business has picked up substantially. Ranjana mentioned our business trip to India. It was very revealing to me when we said we're doing a business mission, uh, but this ended up being the largest business mission in the history of the United States to, to any country, all countries included, 250 plus people. That was impressive in itself. It showed you there's an appetite there, but was also revealing in that number was that some, almost half, 46 percent, I can recall, of the participants had never been to India before. So there's an appetite in the United States for greater connectivity, greater understanding, greater reach in India. We also, by the way, just, just in passing, uh, we're having up our staff and roping up our new office in India. It turns, turns out that we have the, the Commerce Department, the Commercial Service, has seven offices in India now, more than any other country in the world. Uh, again, just a reflection of the strength of the relationship. But look, all of that, <coughs> all of that, those numbers just sort of reflect the policy shift. Because I think the good economic news is really not because of the business missions. Uh, the business missions reflect what's going on. What's going on is the policy choices of the Indian government and the hard work of the Indian people. I'll give you a few examples some of which we fit into, some of which are standalone India. But in civil aviation, one year ago, U.S. and India signed an open skies agreement that allows for civil aviation from either country to freely enter the other country. Within one year, the, both the number of flights and the number of passengers went up by 60 percent. Second example, India announced in its budget this year that it was reducing its tariffs on industrial goods from 12.5 to 10 percent. That's a proportion of quite a significant reduction. Third example, <coughs> India extended basic patent protections to pharmaceuticals, agricultural chemicals, other food products, and that's going to lead to more innovation and investment in India. A fourth example, India's relaxed investment caps in areas like telecommunications and single brand retail. And fifth, this example maybe pertains more to us, the Indian side, but certainly reflects strength on both sides. 
the Commerce Department has announced that we plan to sponsor a television show in India this fall about educational opportunities in the United States. But we would only be doing this because of the base fact that more students from India study at U.S. universities than from any other country. So there's a huge opportunity for greater connectivity there. Indian students place a premium on excellence. We think we have some of the top institutions globally, and so this show ought to uh, be the right fit for the market, so to speak. Well, so there's a lot of good news. There's a lot of positive movements out there. <coughs> Let me say, beyond that good news, there are a lot of challenges as well, and I'll give you a few examples of those. First, back to those investment caps. Uh, in several industries, India still places significant limits on foreign investment and ownership in businesses. Uh, in the retail sector, uh, the conventional, what we call multi-brand stores, uh, are banned or severely limited in India, and that's a penalty paid by Indian consumers <coughs> in higher prices and reduced product selection. Now, there have been some cracks in the dam, uh, but there are significant barriers to remain. There are significant barriers to investment in financial services, in banking and insurance. Insurance, foreign firms are capped at 20 per 6 ownership. Foreign companies can't participate in the pension sector. Government-owned banks uh, still dominate financial service sector, and investment caps limit foreign ownership to 49 percent. Uh, so we think there are a lot of inefficiencies in the financial sector that could be mitigated if U.S. companies were allowed to play a role. Because opening those markets up would lower borrowing costs, lower premiums, increase the volume and effectiveness of capital allocation, and if increase the breadth of product offering. There would be a range of benefits that would come from a strength in the financial sector. Though <coughs> we should also remember we talk about financial sector reform in India, we're talking about infrastructure reform because it's long-term investment vehicles that are going to allow for that infrastructure development. So we talk about insurance companies participating in the Indian market. It's to finance uh, the infrastructure that India needs. Inward FDI grew last year by 44 percent. That's a great number. But it was from a low base. So it grew by 44 percent to 9.5 billion. Prime Minister Singh in a recent speech said that India's infrastructure needs are 320 billion. So there's quite a gap between what's coming in and what's needed. Now, some of this is going to be domestically financed, so it's not all uh, from outward, uh, inward. But let me put it in perspective and look at some other countries. Ranjana mentioned I lived in Singapore for a few years. India received about uh, $45 billion, uh, the total stock of $45 billion of inward FDI. Singapore has 186, about four times as much. Uh, of this, U.S. ratios are about the same. U.S. invested about $8 billion in India and about $48 billion in Singapore, about six times as much. So there's plenty of room for growth. And when you look at India's needs for power plants, roads, airports, rails, highways, seaports, uh, there's opportunities there for financial intermediation. Well, that's investment caps. Beyond investment caps, the second point is those tariffs. I talked about the reduction from 12.5 to 10. That is a good move in the right direction, but that's industrial goods. Average tariff is still about 20 percent. In some cases, tariffs are over 100 uh, percent. We just we talked with some friends in the Indian government earlier today and commented that the tariff on coffee is 100 percent. Compare India's average tariff on industrial goods with 10 percent, even that, with the U.S. average of 4 percent. So we think there's room for improvement on that segment as well. Third, we think patent improvement is moving along, but India is not yet at WIPO standards, their copyright law. And we think if India wants to meet its aspirations of leading in intellectual property, it's got to have gold standard when it comes to intellectual property protection. I'll give you some news in that regard at the risk of sounding overly negative. One estimate was that 74 percent of India software is pirated. We also believe that India is a leading manufacturer of counterfeit pharmaceuticals. And I would say paradoxically, the entertainment uh, products in India suffer from piracy. I say paradoxically because India is also the leading producer of entertainment products in the world. 
So it hurts our industry, but also hurts Indi Indian industry as well. Um, it's interesting, something that you pick up when you visit, I've had the chance to visit India now three times in the last 12 months, but one, of all the impressions you get, one of the core impressions you get when you visit India is this is a culture and a society that is endlessly innovative. It, there's a natural entrepreneurial element, there's a natural sort of problem solving approach to whether it's business or broader life issues and uh, it's no surprise at all that Bollywood is so successful and that there's a substantial element of that economy is based on cultural exports but the point is if there were stronger IP protection it would be stronger still. Well and we've got some other issues we're looking at for the rest of this year as well. Postal reform, medical services, uh, the finance ministry has uh, aspirations to help Mumbai become a regional finance center, uh, open access to <coughs> foreign broadcast and cable TV. All of these issues are part of our ongoing discussion with India. And we have regular trade consultations with them person to person or through uh, satellite feed. Um, I've got to say this, having delineated some of the areas where we see challenges, in my view, there's a general convergence in our policy discussion. Uh, a lot of discussion has to do with the pace and the political appetite for some of these changes. Um, I'll conclude with this thought. I, I hope you derive from my remarks that there's no doubt in my mind that India is moving in the right direction. And there's an uh, energy and uh, growth the economy which is dynamic. But there's an important question, I think, <coughs> in this process. Is India on a long-term path of reform, or are we simply looking at the Indian moment? So will these reforms continue for a sustained period of time, or will India pull back? I don't mean retrograde, but I mean will it hit a plateau? Well, this is a question for the Indian government, for the Indian people to answer. But you can also sense in India this sort of ongoing competition between economic rationalism that wants to move ahead and economic nationalism that prefers business as usual. And as India grapples with this competition, the uh, United States is firmly on the side of reform, as I suspect most of the people <coughs> in this room are as well. Um, the point is we want to see the relations between our two economies expand and improve. And back to uh, my opening comment, as India internationalizes, having that anchor relationship with the United States will allow India's economy to open up in sort of a measured fashion with uh, having access to the U.S. market with a rules-based system uh, and the ability to accelerate reform but still mitigate challenges that arise in the process of reform. Globalization is such a broad term. It's multifaceted. There's a range of rewards and risks in the process. I spoke in my brief remarks only on the economic dimension. I talked about different impressions one gets when one gets to India, but a, a third impression that I received uh, in my trips to India is an overwhelming sense of optimism about the future. So I'm optimistic about the future of India, and I'm optimistic about U.S.-India relationships, primarily because India is optimistic about itself. And it's a country that believes in itself and its capabilities. And any country of that nature is well on the path to overcoming the challenges the future holds. So thank you for the chance to share some thoughts. We can take some questions. Absolutely. Great. Would you thank like you. To? <laughs> Would you like to take the questions there? Right? Want me to? Go ahead, whatever you're comfortable. I'll return to the. Thank you. Okay. Uh, where's the mics? Who's got the mics? Okay. Anyway, I think we can hear you all right, Aziz Hanifa from. Ambassador uh, Lavi, no issue in uh, U.S. India relations in recent times uh, has sort of mobilized the Indian American community, U.S. business industry, as this U.S. India civilian nuclear deal. Mm. But it seems to have run into some sort of a limbo with the 123 agreement being stalled. And, uh, uh, you know, Commerce Secretary Gutierrez, who went out there, Energy Secretary Sam Gottman, who went out there, uh, clearly have said that the ball is now in India's court. Uh, is there a concern uh, that this is not coming to fruition, 
because it's not on the formal agenda of the nuclear suppliers group, etc. And, and the reason that never have U.S. business and industry come together in such a way, and I think they have probably done so with a lot of vested interests, uh, naturally. Uh, is there a concern that uh, the ball is in India's court, but India doesn't seem to be returning the say so? Well, first let me say I agree, I think, with your premise that uh, what both countries are trying to do is to move the relationship ahead uh, in an important area. And it's unprecedented that we're looking at a sort of one country uh, modification of these international codicils that govern uh, civilian nuclear energy for the benefit of India. Uh, so I think it's an unprecedented move on behalf of the United States. No one else has been given this kind of courtesy or privilege. Uh, it's also unprecedented for India. I think India is properly very proud of what it's built up on its own. Uh, and um, they have to now find a way to integrate their system into this international framework. So both sides are moving, and both sides are undertaking steps that, you know, their systems, their regulators, the bureaucracy uh, aren't familiar with, but I think are on board. Um, so it can take a while. Uh, we think we've responded in good faith. We think the Indians are working in good faith, and now we're into the nitty-gritty of the implementing details. The one, two, three agreement is an important element of that. Uh, I don't think there's any concern on the U.S. side, but I think that the sooner we get it done, the better. There's a lengthy pipeline in these projects, even when you get the entire approval process through. So let's not waste an extended period of time getting this through, but we'll work it through in a way that the Indian side is comfortable, uh, the U.S. side is comfortable, the international community is comfortable. We can go ahead with the, the business. There is enormous support for this in the U.S. Uh, business community, as you can imagine. I think you put your finger right on it. Mr. Ray, we could read there at the back. <coughs> Thanks. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, uh, Ms. Khanna, in her opening uh, uh, introductory remarks, uh, reminded us that you were instrumental in the bilateral uh, free trade agreement between Singapore and the United States and obviously have uh, much experience in this area. As you know, uh, U.S. India Business Council, with whom uh, I'm affiliated, has uh, launched uh, a, uh, pro a project in terms of getting a roadmap uh, uh, for trade relations between U.S. and India in the future, and that's whether or not the Doha Round goes. I'm wondering, from your experience, if you could give us uh, some guidepost, if you will, or some uh, tour of uh, principles that we ought to keep in mind as we look at the question of uh, uh, the trade relationship between the uh, United States and India. Well, the good news, Ray, is that the relationship is moving along with some very nice numbers. The rate of growth is very high. We just got back the uh, February numbers this morning, in fact, and the first two months this year, over the first two months last year, I think our exports are up 46 percent or something. We still have a trade deficit, but, but those are very nice numbers of growth. Uh, the challenge is, as I indicated before, uh, we're making up for lost time. In a way, the relationship is still sort of climbing out of a hole. We still should be ahead of where we are, uh, so we're playing catch up. Um, I think your contribution could be extremely helpful in helping uh, prepare the policy environment, because the more that both countries move toward economic rationalism, liberalizing, privatizing, deregulating, allowing for competition, uh, the more opportunities there are for businesses to participate and the more we're going to be able to sustain these high rates of economic growth that are so important for India. Uh, I mentioned a few areas of concern for us in the course of my remarks. Let me go back and just highlight financial services, and I highlight that because in a lot of respects, if we look at economic reform and progress, financial services is really the foundation for overall economic performance. It will help other companies participate in the market. It will allow for higher rates of growth of those companies. So it gives you a good foundation for overall economic activity. I would say the other one, so to speak, is somewhat fixed, which is the civil aviation. I mean, if you've got open skies, you've got easy entrance and access to the 
U.S. and Indian carriers are still build, building out their route structure. India has a regulation that says you can't go international until you've been in the domestic market five years, which on one hand I don't think that is fair to the Indian airlines, but it's an Indian domestic regulation. Uh, so we're moving ahead maybe more rapidly than the Indian side is moving ahead. Um, so it might take a few years for us to be uh, where the market wants us to be on that. But that's also a vital element to just helping U.S. businesses and Indian businesses connect. We have a question in the center. I think we'll move forward from there. Uh, Lisa, Pastor. Yeah, if you could just take the mic. Please identify yourself and ask a question. Um, I'm Suma. I just recently graduated from the George Washington School of Business. That's great. Um, uh, thanks, Mr. Lavin, for your uh, insightful overview on the Indo-U.S. relations regarding trade and uh, future prospects. My question concerns your comment um, on the preferred policy of uh, entry of multi-brand um, uh, retail stores into right. India. Uh, there have been criticisms to, um, to this, this, this strategy, uh, which includes the fact that uh, a considerable segment of the Indian population works in the unorganized sector, which makes up um, which makes up uh, a part of the diversified retail structure. And in fact, uh, one could actually say that the Indian way of life centers around these diversified uh, rural um, outlets in urban, semi-rural, and um, rural India. So what would you say um, to criticisms of entry of multi-brand stores into India? I, I think this just gives the Indian consumer a choice. If, if they're price sensitive, and if the range of products is important to them, then they're going to have a preference for the larger stores. But on some products, uh, or some consumers are less price sensitive, and they can be content with uh, business as usual. But particularly in rural areas, where maybe the single most important socioeconomic issue is poverty, when you're giving somebody 20% more purchasing power, 30% more purchasing power, that's a wonderful statement to make. I mean, that's terrific if that gift can be given to the poor Indian consumer. Uh, so I wouldn't dismiss it. I would, I'd say let's, let's give the, the man on the street, so to speak, the consumer the choice, the opportunity to purchase, use their dollars, their rupiah, how they choose to uh, use it, and, and they can deploy it as they want. And by the way, I think we'll see the same pattern we see in other countries, which is, look, it's not the demise or the end of the uh, local shops but it does give them some price competition. They've got to take the prices down a bit. So uh, we didn't see a huge shift in purchasing patterns, but we did see price compression. So it's good news for the man on the street. I think we have a question here. I think my voice will carry well. <laughs> Uh, sir, I am uh, Sridhar with the Press Trust of India. Uh, there's a lot of uh, perception or misperception in India over the issue of uh, uh, sanctions that you keep talking about uh, wanting to take uh, a giant leap uh, forward with India, but India is still a sanctioned country. Um, can you just throw some light on it as to how... Uh, you mean with regard, to the, with regard to the nuclear agreement? Yeah, with regard to you know, what are the sanctions, you, you still have the entities list. Sure. And, uh, well, we have, I mean, India has its own export control policy as well. I mean, so every country will have an export control policy about what it's permitted to sell and what it doesn't permit to sell. Uh, so, for example, uh, we would have, and, and if it's a controlled item, it doesn't mean it's a banned item. It means there's a licensing product and you have to go through it. But, for example, military hardware, uh, application of uh, nuclear technology is certainly going to be controlled, usually... Uh, products that deal with uh, space programs are controlled. Uh, so, uh, but that's a, that's a normal, mature relationship. Uh, <coughs> even among countries with whom we have a formal military alliance and long-standing relationships, we'll have a licensing and approval process for a transfer of technology. The challenge is that the relationship with the U.S. and India is moving so rapidly ahead that sometimes the licensing approval regime doesn't always keep up. So you've got to continually adjust that to reflect the fact that uh, it's a very different relationship than even five years ago. I think 
we're doing reasonably well with that, as these numbers would suggest. You wouldn't quite see such high rates of growth if there were structural impediments out there. Um, but we need to keep at it because, I mean, three years from now it will be different again than it is today. And this nuclear agreement is a significant uh, step ahead. I'll, if I may, the next opportunity to take a step ahead beyond the nuclear agreement is the competition in India for the multi-role combat aircraft because uh, historically the United States has not been able to compete uh, for Indian defense procurement. Now it's a new era. It's a new relationship. The uh, defense relationship is improving readily. Um, we've had a number of discussions with counterparts on the Indian side, and uh, our major providers intend to compete for this. But the point is, to your question, this brings into call a question then a lot of licensing uh, elements, and it forces our system to reassess where it stands and to go ahead with the permitting process. Right, because India is going to insist on a frontline combat aircraft that's the best in the world, so it forces our fellows to say, look, let's try to move this relationship ahead in that regard. Uh, so, I, I mean, I view it as a healthy exercise. Okay, we have two questions in the center and <coughs> at the back. Could, we, could we, would you want to bring it in front? Okay. <coughs> Hello, sir. No, don't you think that if Excuse me, could you identify yourself, oh, please, sorry? Uh, my name is Bulbul Sen. I am just a homemaker. So don't you think um, that if you go there and uh, flying uh, and put the bottle of uh, Cokes in a rural village like Kapgari, where I used to work, and people will, when the uh, and people of there, they don't know what is Coca-Cola. And when they tested it, they like to buy it at any cost and pirates, you know, even the adulterate things. And uh, people are like to, you know, they don't want to go like Gandhi said in a grassroots. They don't develop the grassroots thing. They are going for the foreign things. That's why the piracy things are coming because the cost is so high. People are buying the adulterate things because it's cheap. So what I, is the question? Well, no, I understand that's why piracy yeah. takes place. Yeah. That's, that's why shoplifting takes uh, place, if too. You, if you put a, you because know, it's cheap. Like, uh, you know, top economy from the outside. India right. is going at its pace from the grassroots level. Well, uh, look, I'll tell you my like view. My uh, grandma uh, don't, never went to school. Yeah. But, but is, I, that, is that the model for India, that we should seek that people don't go to school and have simple rural lives? Is that what you aspire to for your children? No. But I mean that we are growing at a space, but uh, we don't, uh, you know, that well, you are going there putting some Walmart. I, I would say this. If, if you like growing at a certain pace, mm -hmm. then we have no disagreement. Then don't buy Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. We have no disagreement at all. I, I've got a different view, which is we should respect the wishes of the people of India. Yeah. So if somebody aspires to send their child to university and says, I want to grow at a faster pace, we should respect that and find a way for that person to go to university and have a better life. If somebody has some other desire, aspiration, hopefully the economic or political system will allow that person to reach their aspirations. But uh, if you don't, if you don't have aspirations, I respect that as well. No, that is out of question. I am like to question you that how could you, you know, solve the poverty and uh, make, uh, you know, going to uh, the consumer level. If you yeah. go to a village, they don't have a dollar to buy things for their food or clothes. Yeah. If you go to city of Kolkata, well, I think you, you have put that. your. If but I, how how yeah, they will reach the consumer uh, level? You know, you have to give incentive. You can't give I'm, the credit card I'm willing to respond. There. I'm willing to respond. Mm -hmm. I, I think, if I may, uh, respond uh, more generally, because I think you put your finger on maybe one of the vexing questions of the 21st century, or the 20th century, which is the question of poverty. Mm -hmm. Why does it persist in some countries? Why does it not persist in other countries? Or how do you get out of it? Why did India have grinding poverty for 30 years and only since 1991 start to move away from poverty? What was it? It was the same people, the same resources, the same culture, the same tradition, but for the first several decades of independence had almost no economic growth. Then all of a sudden it's an economic miracle, one of the fastest rates of growth in the history of the world. More people being freed from the misery of poverty than almost any other country in the world. Only China, you could say, has done better than that in terms of movement. Why was that? Most people would look at that. Well, some people might say it's a cycle. <laughs> some people might say that India made a series of policy choices 
And then they made different policy choices. And if you look at different rates of economic growth around the world, you say there's nothing cyclical about it. Every country makes its own decisions. People make their own decisions. Do you want high rates of economic growth or low rates of economic growth? India historically, for much of its history, chose low rates of economic growth. Now it has chosen high rates of economic growth. My view is the country is better off with a higher rate of GDP growth, even though it can also bring with it problems and challenges. But at least you're relieving people from the misery of poverty. So my advice to my friends in India is I suggest you try to keep on this rate of uh, rapid economic growth because you're going to pull hundreds of million people out of this grinding poverty that we can see in rural India. Now, what they do, I think, is their choice. How they live their life should be completely their choice. So uh, if they want to buy a consumer product or not, if they want a simple life or not, but maybe somebody there says, I want to go to university. I want to be a doctor. I want to be an inventor. I want to be a school teacher. I want to be a business person. We should let them do that. So I think the best society is one that allows people to go as far as they can with their talents. So you have to have some kind of mechanism for economic mobility. You have to have some kind of structure that allows people to get education. You have to have some kind of open market system so that people can pursue careers and paths and hopes. And India is going down that path. So I applaud Indian leadership for making those choices. Okay, next question here. Um, this is Sudha from Manchester Trade. Thank you for your comments. Um, I have two questions and one quick comment. You spoke about the television show which you're going to have in India regarding U.S. education. Mm. I think all Indian young graduates there are very much aware of opportunities in U.S. Uh, so a television show I think would be a little too late for having gone to school here. I can say that and especially since you know that visa has been like a big issue with Indian students here. And my question would be for you, when you said that um, financial sector should be more open in India, uh, I was wondering if you could comment on the fact that uh, during the Asian crisis, financial crisis, India was not as much affected as the other countries. And many people attribute that to the closed financial sector in India because it was not too much of FDI which could flow out of the country. <coughs> so if the economy is more open now, yeah. do you think it's more risk prone? Also, could you comment yeah. on uh, Schwab's, uh, Susan Schwab's visit to India? What do you expect out of that? That's too many questions in one go. <laughs> <laughs> That's just two on a comment. That's Sorry. Right. Two plus one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let, let's just. Well, but no, I think I can do this quickly. The, 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 the idea of the television show in India, well, I mean, look, you might be right. I mean, when does, when does advertising promotional activity make sense or help out, and when is it not useful? I guess you, you, if your premise is correct, it's not useful if everybody's completely aware of the product or the attribute. So if there's sort of perfect knowledge in India about opportunities in the United States and we're sort of at our ceiling now and that relationship can't grow, I think your point is right, that uh, there's no sense putting extra promotional effort in it. My hunch is... There still might be people in India, substantial segments of the population, this emerging middle class, who know vaguely that there's opportunities in America but would value extra information. But we'll try it once at least. We'll see what happens. I might call you back in six months and say you were right. We, nobody followed up on this. We, we ran it last year in, in, in China. We reached about 180 million households. We think we've got about 30 million viewers. We're getting on the web page that's drawn to TV about 125,000 hits a month, and we're seeing a lift in application from China, about 10% plus. So, you know, we think that was a good program. Maybe we'll do an in India and say, by God, I, it was foolish. This fellows in India all knew about us, and no sense running it. So you could be right. I, I, I suspect that there might not be perfect knowledge in India. I might just interject here. Yeah. You know, the problem in India is not going to be the awareness. The problem is also that you would have to gear up the system in the embassies for visas, I thought that's what she was mentioning, that yeah. a lot of students do get admissions and they have visa problems. There's a range, so of, there's a range, of, range of issues range to be of issues. addressed. There's a range of issues, but the point is, uh, you know, you, let's work on one part mm -hmm. of his work on other ones. And as you know, David Mulford, I think, just deserves a round of applause for his work on visas. I think visa applications is up something like 50% a year for three years in a row. And I can tell you this, having run an embassy, you don't get 50% increase in staff three years in a row. You don't get 50% increase in, in, in budget three years in a row. So he is doing a great job. Absolutely. He's got turnaround time under 30 days. So you know, I wouldn't say it's completely solved, but I think you say you've got a system that works. It. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, we have a question in the fourth row. Oh, I was going to get the second here. one. Oh, the I was, second I was one. going to oh, get the second one. I can't even remember it now. What was the? No, no, that was the third one. Financial. Oh, financial. 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 Wasn't India wise by not being internationally integrated? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think you're right that if, you are, if you're financially isolated, then you get no shocks. So you want a system that can manage through shocks. But you can have your cake and eat it, too. You can be, I mean, you look at what countries did suffer during the 97 financial crisis. It was a handful of countries. 
So they were internationally open, but they didn't have a regulatory mechanism. Uh, so you had hot money. You had a, a lot of capital outflows. You had a mismatch between payments and debt obligations. And so you had economic crisis. But is it possible to have both international capital mobility and a regulated financial system? I think you'd say the OECD countries, I think without exception, suffered nothing from the, the financial crisis in 97. So the real question is, can India perform at that level? Can India perform the way that other advanced countries participate? I think India can. So India should be able to get all the benefits of international financial activity and still have a well-regulated economy. Third question, Schwab, I can answer that. I don't know what she's, I know what she's doing, but I can't give you any report because I haven't heard back from her, uh, so I can't provide any insight on that. It's WTO negotiations, so. You have a question at the back there? How much time do you have? I will go forward till the 15 minute mark. Okay, 15 minutes. perfect. Uh, I'm Nandini Kuti, I'm an independent consultant. I was curious about the statistic you cited that the delta change in the growth of the Indian economy is equal to the size of the Indian economy 35 years ago. Mm -hmm. That's a staggering statistic. Mm. I was wondering, is that adjusted for inflation? I couldn't tell you. <laughs> because inflation has been quite high too. Yeah. Yeah, was staggering. But, you know, you think about economic growth uh, for the last 15 years has been very nice single-digit growth. So if you get decent average 15 years would be, what do you think, 5 7% for 15 years? I mean, that means you're going to basically double in uh, 15 years, and then you go back 20 years beyond that, maybe it wouldn't have quite have doubled again. I mean, I see it being in real terms that you can... A 10 percent, the, the, the point would be India's economy 35 years ago would maybe be one-tenth of what it is today. Is that realistic or not? You tell me. We have a question there. Thank you. Surjit Man Singh, American University. I'd like to go back to this educational issue. Mm -hmm. I accept what you say about competition in the economic field. What are you doing about competition in the education field? Um, Many of the, I mean, there are some good universities in India, but a great number of them are not good enough. How, what is the U.S. government's reaction to efforts by some, not very many, but a few private American universities to establish campuses in India? In other words, bring the same grade of high quality education in India without having the enormous expense of studying in the United States? No, we welcome that. The, the limitation has been on the Indian side, not on our side. Uh, India historically had prohibited this. But now I think there's a bill introduced in Parliament to liberalize. Has the bill gone through? It's gone through. It's gone through. But we welcome it. And look, education today, if you, I mean, let me use sort of commercial shorthand, a consumer purchasing a product. Uh, so forgive my simplification. But it's... It's very different than a, even a generation ago where a person might be expected to go to a four-year institution and go through for four years. But we have people going abroad for a year, taking a semester overseas, doing distance learning programs, doing Internet-based uh, learning. So the likelihood of a person in India getting at least some exposure to the U.S. system and vice versa is way, way above where it was uh, a generation ago. I think very much the good of both countries and we should do whatever we can to foster this. I think uh, people will go through this college experience in another country, exposed to another society, and 50 years from now, uh, it'll, they'll still hold fast to that experience. It's a very important moment when they connect with friends from the other side. They learn something about the way the other society operates. There's a question here. Aramis Warren from Ajans France Press. So you mentioned just now about the uh, prospects of the multi-role fighter combat jets. And uh, is there any, are there any arrangements that the United States has proposed to India by which such sales could be done? No, the, uh, the uh, tender offer has not been made yet, so we're still in an informal discussion period. But I just know that the, uh, the leading airframe manufacturers in the United States intend to compete for this. And I think that's a healthy development from the Indian perspective. I dare say they are, uh, have access to a very fine suite of products. And from a U.S. perspective is with regard to the previous gentleman's question that this 
helps our system think through this licensing and export control system because they have a, a specific proposal in front of them that they have to respond to. So I think that's a healthy development as well. We have a question in the center there. Okay, and after that, just behind you. He's been very patient here. My name is Gopala Benjamuri. I just retired from the Department of Transportation. When we, in the name of commerce, pushed the ever-growing middle class in India, simultaneously there is also a growing population who are, let us say, have nots, not as much as what the middle class has. So the, if the goods are available but the have nots cannot afford it, there may be a societal problem. So we may not want to push too hard commerce-wise to the, towards the middle class by, say, big retailing or broadcasting. Whatever. That's my comment. Well, we ought to think about that because I think you'd say with almost any change in society, there's a segment that is going to be likely to benefit more rapidly or more thoroughly than other segments. And that's true with economic growth or that's true with new technology introduction. But I think I would still say we're better off having the benefit, even though not everybody will necessarily benefit or the same way. I mean, so when telephones are introduced and 1% of the population has telephones, and that might create societal issues. And wiser people would say, well, look, over time, we think more than 1% will enjoy this. But maybe for the first few decades, it's a very small. Is that good or not to do that? I think you've really got no choice but to say we want our society to move ahead. We want new technology. So if we were to say to Indian uh, college students now, look, Internet penetration in India is still pretty modest. And this really heightens a gap, frankly, between poor people and more middle class. Let's do what we can to do away with Internet usage. I mean, that would not be the right step for India, would it? I mean, the point is I think you've just got to find a way to move your society ahead, even though some segments. So when you say... To put it in economic context now, India's economy, we hope, is going to grow at a high rate for the near term. We hope. I hope so in any event. But what, what does that mean? That means there's going to be a certain segment of that population which are more employable, people who are literate as opposed to people who are illiterate. I mean, if you're illiterate, it might not matter as much whether economic growth is 2% or 10%. If you're literate, you say, look, I've got a better chance. I can do something. So what should we do if we were an Indian policymaker? Should we say, let's not push this gap? I think we should say the best way to help the folks who are illiterate and can't directly benefit is we've got to allow the people who really can benefit to go as far as they can. And then we'll build up the economy a bit. We'll have more tax revenue. We can have programs to help those that might be left behind. But I think to do it otherwise, it would be a mistake. Yeah, I think I alluded to that, that there's, there's finite appetite for change, even if it's to the economic benefit of the country. And I said I think U.S. has this dimension as well, and I termed it uh, sort of a competition between economic rationalism and economic nationalism. So economic rationalism tells us that the country will better off, that welfare will be maximized by high rate of economic growth. But that competes against all sorts of other impulses where people are, there's a natural sort of protectionist impulse many people have, or a nationalist impulse, or as you point out, a bias for the status quo. I mean, so, you know, it's, it's difficult some, in some situations to hold out the prospect for better life if people are at some degree of satisfaction with their current life. Uh, so you're right, all of these come into play. But I'd say, you know, do you want to live in the 21st century or not? I mean, do you want your society to move ahead or not? And look, Indian government, and this is across the political spectrum, across the parties, says let's move the society ahead. You know, the only way we're going to take these people out of poverty is with high rates of growth. So I think everybody agrees with your points, but put it in context, say we've got no choice but to step on the gas pedal and try to move this country ahead. See, globalization is going to bring in inequalities. That's a known fact. The best thing is to have you know, the total public-private participation to combat the inequalities. It cannot be just a government issue because that's going to create a, a tough task. It will have to be a public-private partnership. And if you had heard the first presentation made by Mr. Waklus from Tata, they talked about redeploying 30% of the profits from the private sector into back into the development of the equality. Next question. 
Uh, Dennis Cooks from the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, I believe one of the areas of contention between the U.S. and India has to do with uh, agricultural trade policy. I wonder if you could elaborate for us, and I'm, frankly, I'm ignorant on this, yeah. the, what the differences are from the Indian perspective and the, from the American perspective. Well, frankly, what? it ties in with the previous question, and I have to tell you, it's my cousins down to the Agriculture Department who deal with this more directly, so I might share uh, your ignorance. but. The highest tariff rates you'll find in India on agricultural products, 100 percent plus prohibitive tariffs. Uh, but apropos of the previous question, a uh, sizable percentage of Indian population works on the land. So I think it's proper for political leadership to be concerned with this fact that society would be better off with low tariffs, uh, but you can't just dislocate 100 million people or fire 100 million people or tell them go find another job. You know, you've got to find some path that allows them to move on to where they can be better deployed and earn a better living, and then the rest of the society can benefit from probably a higher amount of import. So it's going to be step by step. In my view, India could probably move faster than it's currently moving, but there are political constraints. What is the American side of that? Because the Indians are, have, I believe, have objections to our trade policy in agriculture. And I well. Now, they've got pretty good access to our markets. The one issue front and center of us, which I think this might be solved this week in the course of Sue Schwab's visit, uh, is uh, mango exports to the United States. And we've got a uh, phytosanitary requirement. I only know this. I mean, it's not a commerce issue. However, what is run out of commerce is NIST, National Institute for Science and Technology, and we manage the telemetry equipment that establishes the parameters for uh, radiation machinery for food safety. And so, you know, you get these panic emails about two weeks ago, you've got to get somebody to India right away because it's, a, you know, we've got to verify that it's proper. So I'm, God knows what. So I only know about this because it happened to have sort of a comic favor. And I know, all I know is we sent to get out there and fix whatever you've got to fix. So, but I can't tell you beyond that uh, where it's going. But, but the current complaint, so to speak, or the only real concern we had from the Indian side was on this mango point, you know, which, which is a fair point. We ought to be open to the mangoes. We've got safety requirements. They, I'm certain they can meet it, but then you have to validate that they're meeting. That was the point. So nobody thought or suggested they weren't where they need to be, but you've got to be able to attest to it. So it has to be measured, and then in they go. So hopefully we'll all be having mango fruit cocktails pretty soon. Yes, please. Hi, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Tyler. This, this is the last one, I think. Okay. Thanks. Tyler Roborn with the Department of Agriculture. Um, there, there's your answer. <laughs> and you were silent during this last bit, too. Uh, rural development, though, not really as far as agriculture <laughs> policy. <laughs> right. I was just curious. You, you mentioned that you recently led the biggest uh, delegation of businesses, of U.S. businesses over there. Uh, what opportunities exist for U.S. businesses over there? What are the biggest opportunities that you see? Yeah, for U.S. businesses in India? Look, India is booming. India is, look, it's not just a country, it's a continent. I mean, when you're that scale of population and size and number of people and you've got that high rate of growth, there's just an extraordinary range of opportunity. So it's everything from Boeings to laptops to soybean uh, to personal care products. I mean, it is extraordinary. And you know this, you know, what we, what we know about consumer behavior uh, is that you get to a certain threshold point and your amount of discretionary income goes up dramatically. So that, but it's usually around one, two, three thousand dollars $3,000 a year when you're sort of through the basic necessities, but all of a sudden you finally hit $2,200 a year and you can buy a motorbike or you can buy an air conditioner or you can buy a PC or you can get a credit card or you're starting to debate. So your whole consumer pattern changes because you're, you're no longer struggling with the daily necessities of life. The point is you've got hundreds of millions of people in India who are on the cusp of that. So if you get a 10% rise in income, you might get a 30% rise in consumer purchases or a 50% rise in motorbikes or something like that because finally for the first time in their lives, they're able to buy these things that you know make for the comforts of everyday life and give them a chance to have a little enjoyment. So you're seeing that pattern unfold dramatically. I think with that question, I would like to bring this session to a close. I have to thank Ambassador Lawin, who is not for without any reason called the America's salesman-in-chief. 
I asked him if he thought salesman in chief was right for him. <laughs> it has to be elevated. But <laughs> you sell the US so well all the time. Yeah. And I have to thank Bob Hathaway for all his support for getting Ambassador Lau in here for this uh, program because <laughs> there can be nothing complete on US-India relationships in the economic field without Undersecretary Lavin's presence being here. And thank you so much, Bob, and the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, we, I'd now like to bring this session to a close and invite Bhumika with uh, Dr. Kapoor to continue with the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.